you know, it's on my water bottle. It's not very effective, but you get the spirit of it. So, so welcome everyone. And thanks. I know this is a particularly busy time in the semester. And look, we have our consul, Ingen Turesen, who's the consul in Chicago. He's also one of our... Well, uh, Ingen, Merhaba. <laughs> Shall I call you uh, Mr. Consul <laughs> General? Well, actually, I'm proud to say that he was one of my former students. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, Mustafa Kiburglu has quite a network, um, and we are pleased that he is part of our network, but our current students uh, consul, uh, Ingen Turesen, is one of his former students. Um, so welcome. So I am Philip Blake. I know most of you, um, but I'm one of the faculty members in the Nonproliferation and Terrorism Studies program and a faculty affiliate here at CNS. And the reason that I'm sharing this is because Bill Potter is on travel. Jessica Varnum, who does a lot of Turkey policy work, um, is on maternity leave. Um, and I have done a fair bit of work uh, in the past, including interacting uh, with our speaker that's uh, Turkey oriented. Um, so we are really lucky to have Dr. Uh, Mustafa Kibaroglu uh, or as I like to think of him, Dr. Nonproliferation, uh, when it comes to, uh, to Turkey. Uh, he has a remarkable presence in this field. He is a prolific publisher, engages deeply with um, both governments and international bodies around the world. Um, he is also part of the Miss Mafia. In fact, he might be described <laughs> as a made man in the Miss Mafia, which if you don't know mafia lingo, uh, means like senior partner, um, which means of course that we take all the credit for his professional successes. Um, no, but we are thrilled to have him as part of our, our kind of broader family, family in the, the mafia sense. Um, and uh, yeah, this is fun for me. And I think, you know, Turkey is a particularly interesting country when it comes to non-proliferation broadly for a host of reasons. And it's a particularly interesting country when it comes to Iran and the Iran nuclear issue that has been such a central challenge, though certainly not the only challenge of non-proliferation in recent years. It's something that I've grappled with a little bit. A couple of years ago, I had um, a publication with Aaron Stein, who some of you may know in this field, that's my favorite title that I've had so far, which is uh, Turkish-Iranian relations uh, from friends with benefits to it's complicated. Um, <laughs> and I'm not totally sure that Shaban Kardash understood uh, exactly what that, that idiomatic speech meant, um, but I've liked that and I would say uh, it's still complicated. Um, and Turkey has a really interesting role to play and perspective on the Iranian nuclear issue and more broadly actually on efforts to engage Iran in a regional context. So I'm thrilled that we have Dr. Mustafa Kibaroglu uh, to share with us on that topic today. So I'm gonna give him the floor and then uh, he will speak and then we'll have lots of time for Q&A, uh, both for folks in the room and online at the end. Well, thank, thank you, Flip. It's such a good feeling to be back here. And um, I was a postdoc back in 96, 97 and returned once, I believe it was 2010. Uh, on one occasion, I don't know why I, I was Iran and I just ended up here and gave a conference. Yeah, uh, Scott Sagan's uh, project uh, for that, I was in Stanford and then came down all the way here and um, gave another conference like this. And such a really nice feeling to be with uh, colleagues, friends. Jeff, we know each other from uh, MacArthur Harvard Project now and my former students, Council General and the colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for having me and for inviting me to this um, lecture. Um, actually, when I was asked to speak about, you know, our subject, I just said, uh, you know, why don't I give a Turkish perspective on Iran's nuclear program? And um, Bill Potter suggested, why don't you give a Turkish perspective on your, the implication for the whole Middle East, not only for Turkey? But I said, okay, fine, let's do it. And um, so I, I, I put together several slides, and this is the Middle East, as you know. Right. Well. <laughs> well, it's not colorful, looks nice, but <laughs> when you get there, it's not that uh, sort of uh, nice uh, on the ground. Um, well, I have several, uh, I mean, a little bit of uh, background information. I know this is a highly qualified uh, you know, crowd and and uh, everybody more or less knowledgeable about the subject matter, but just, I don't know who would be in the audience and depending on your uh, sort of uh, reactions, I may you know, fast forward some slides, but uh, as, as we know, Iran's program has its roots in the utmost for peace uh, <laughs> speech of Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, and uh, you know, just like in the case of Turkey, uh, you know, there is this research reactor, and, and some technical universities campus somewhere else, and not in the, in the university. The same, uh, you know, uh, took place in Tehran University, a small 
you know, full type of five megawatt uh, and research reactor. And then, well, in the 60s and 70s, uh, Iranian Atomic Energy Authority organization has a budget of $1 million equivalent uh, in reals, of course. But uh, after the, um, uh, the OPEC crisis in 74, uh, oil prices quadruple, almost uh, increased uh, sharply. And uh, so did um, Shah, uh, you know, for the scale of uh, Iranian nuclear program and uh, invested in, and increased the budget to $1 billion. I know from uh, the uh, person who was chairing, uh, heading, uh, leading the institution at the time in his uh, book. So uh, there is this 20,000 megawatt electric in 20 years, a kind of motto for Iran's nuclear program. And then there is this also the initiation of the nuclear free zone in the Middle East, something that just the sugar caught the Iranian nuclear ambitions. And of course, with the Islamic revolution, uh, things go south and, and uh, program on Germans, French, and Americans who rushed to, uh, to Iran prior to that, uh, during the Shah period to sell technology, reactors, and everything. Uh, this time, none of them <laughs> showed up, uh, of course. Uh, and as uh, American-Iranian relations deteriorated, that also secondary or direct impact on uh, the project, the Boucher project, which was being built by the Germans. Uh, and uh, well, uh, I, I've been to Iran a couple of times back in 2004 and 2005 during my Harvard fellowship. And in, in the first one, I joined the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs delegation, small delegation, because there is this a think tank um, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Center for Strategic Research. And uh, Murat Bilhan, the ambassador, you know, invited me to join the delegation. I was just like you know, crazy, because I always wanted to go to Iran. But to be honest with you, I have some concerns about security because as an individual, you never know who you end up. But anyway, being in the Turkish uh, foreign minister delegation uh, helped me a lot in terms of meeting people. And one of them was Rafsanjani. <laughs> and uh, in his uh, kind of mansion, the big place, he uh, sort of gave us a little bit of information as to how he convinced uh, Khomeini, who first scrapped the Iranian uh, nuclear program when he came to power uh, on the grounds that it would make it dependent on the Europeans and the West. But then uh, when you know uh, they had problems in the, during the Iran-Iraq war, Prof. Sanjani convinced them that it would be nice if they had the program run, going. And uh, then uh, sort of, then he, he got the blessings of uh, Humane and then Look for some partners, and he knocked on every door, and uh, but never got a, a partner to finish the unfinished projects. But finally, uh, especially after Gorbachev made it, he said Gorbachev promised him in 1989, but Gorbachev could not help himself either. And it then came Yasin back in 95. Uh, there, there, you know, there's this uh, Boucher deal. And I was a fellow at the United Nations Institute for some research and doing my a nuclear weapon zone in you know, a project. And at some point I came up with a you know English version of the deal between Russia and, and Iran. And the thing that attracted my attention was this second item here, some 25, 30 doctoral PhD, I mean, and also master's student would be uh, sent to Russian institutions and to advance their studies and also stay there for and make some practice and then go back home. This gave me the impression that Iran was wanting much more than finishing the share project or unfinished project and to be self-sufficient and you know, set on its own feet with respect to nuclear program. And then this is the beginning of my deeper interest. Of course, if, just like everybody in the non proliferation field, Iran was one of the subjects, not the subject for me at the time. But then I followed up on the subject and my first piece that I wrote in 95, published in 96, is Iran going nuclear. And I said, I'm, I'm writing there with, well, we know the Chinese, you know, have them with Natans, especially the enrichment and every, everything. And now comes the Russian. So uh, this uh, combo would give a lot, a lot of boost to the Iranian nuclear program, which may have direct implications for Turkey's security. So we should bear this in mind and keep, you know, a close uh, uh, watch on, on Iran's going on, what's going on there. So um, 
as you know, probably Iran has almost everything now, and back then they 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 were quite passionate in getting to the point where they have uh, you know reached right now. Now uh, there is this uh, problem and the puzzle that I will mention in a minute. Iran is a state party to the MPT. I mean, since uh, six, I mean, MPT signed in eighty six, and they signed and ratified in uh, sorry sixty eight. Uh, and then they signed it right away in 69, right after Shah was quite anxious to go and write and sign and ratify it. And um, therefore they have the capability and the right to entertain the you know, peaceful applications, everything. But uh, especially after uh, Islamic revolution, uh, not only because of uh, the rhetoric, but also what you know the steps that they have taken uh, created concerns in the West. Um, Especially in Israel, in the region, um, just like Egypt, uh, Egypt, Egyptian, uh, and sort of alleged uh, nuclear ambitions, and they, uh, Iran's ambitions were more uh, obvious from the Israeli perspective because uh, Egypt's um, uh, major uh, statement was uh, if another country um, introduces nuclear weapons uh, uh, to the region, they will be next. Uh, almost immediately. So that means they have something ready that can be boosted, given boost if, if necessary. Um, well, during my you know, uh, trips to um, in Tehran, maybe as an anecdote, I can tell you this. Uh, I always introduce myself, look, I am a, a Turkish academic at, you know, hired at Bilkent University teaching this subject. Now I'm at Harvard doing research on Iran and nuclear program. I would be uh, very happy if you spoke to me and uh, answer my questions. And I promise you that I, I will send you the final version of my, whatever I write and get your uh, sort of uh, approval before it goes to print. No one spoke to me, no one. For the whole week, I was like begging. <laughs> I, I, have kind of, I was always repeating myself, knowing that no one would come. But the very last night, and past midnight at around, around 4 a.m., you have flight from Tehran to Istanbul, the Turkish Airlines, and uh, the Turkish ambassador to Tehran gave uh, a, you know, a large you know, dinner reception to the IPIS, which is the, you know, uh, uh, the something similar to Central Strategic Research under the Turkish Ministry, and that there is the seven under the Iranian Ministry. Mustafa Zahrani was the director. And there was a couple of other, you know, uh, uh, young fellows, and who we were there a bit early. And as soon as the Iranians uh, arrived, one of them just came to me and said, "Mustafa, let's sit, and I'm going to talk to you." I said, okay, fine. Is it fine? We're going to talk about other things. Well, you asked too many questions. <laughs> now here are the answers. Oops, <laughs> I don't have my notebook. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So uh, among other things, of course, some of them are in private, in private but um, they said they want the capability to detonate a nuclear device, but not the political decision. I mean, the political decision has not been taken, but they wanted to be admitted to the nuclear club because they are 2,500 years old civilization and they will be there in 2,500 years more and they deserve to be in. <laughs> oh, fine. And then, I, I was trying to take notes of whatever they were saying. I was, you know, even there's a small name place on the table, you know, where your name is written there. I was writing all this or on napkins and everything you know, somewhere like Brett of, you know, wrote it. So I'm um, sure. And a young uh, Turkish diplomats were coming to me asking, Mustafa, did you give them something? <laughs> what, what did they drink? <laughs> no, no, sh 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 stop, stop, don't stop, don't interrupt. And even the Turkish matter was amazed with the way they were coming uh, and you know, so explicit about nuclear program. They even admitted the kind of um, connection with the Africa uh, or not. So I took note of, uh, of everything. And then when we went to the hotel back before the airport, I put them written uh, uh, in my notebook. <laughs> it was uh, problematically wrong. Well, this is. Uh, the uh, now most recent picture because in most of the maps you don't see Gashin, 
uh, which has now added for the last few years. So this uh, uranium mine uh, site, what you normally see yachts or second. Well, um, these are this is information which is uh, available everywhere. Yes, I, I present this as a puzzle because puzzle is something that you know there are too many moves uh, that are contrary to each other, and I somehow resemble this to a puzzle. Because the United States, for instance, wants Iran to permanently want it as you know now until for GCPOA to permanently help uranium enrichment, which they still consider a source of threat. And Iran said they would never agree to a permanent cessation of enrichment due to their uh, imputed rights. While at, the, at, at that time and still the uh, European Union agreed with the US in principle, but uh, you know, they were trying to find a middle way instead of you know. Uh, like uh, U.S. Uh, and Israel with the hawkish administrators or leaders, uh, there was this uh, threat of striking Iranian facilities and the Europeans were trying to find a way to avoid this because there was enough from especially Iraq at the time, 2000s, I'm talking about. Russia supported Iran's right to steal the paper uh, under the MPP, but they have also uh, became active um, as part of the um, you know, P5 plus negotiations. And as you can imagine, I it's, it's just trying to put in their duties in order to be able to you know go there. They want to be able to go there, inspect and verify that they are not diverting uh, anything from peaceful uh, to mainstream. Uh, and um, well, after this, uh, the revelations about Natanz and Iraq facility, uh, that was August uh, 2002. Uh, in Mario's hotel, I guess, in Washington, he said this Mujahideen Hulk, Hulk and Mujahideen, uh, the uh, fighters uh, for, the, for the people who are in exile, of course. And uh, I don't know whether they are still listed on this terrorist organization uh, in the US State Department list, but I think not. I not anymore. Anymore. I think not anymore. But at that time, they were. On the list, but they could. You know, our, our colleague Jason Blazek is with the director of the. Yeah, he probably terrorism. listed that. <laughs> yeah, but at the time they could uh, just like give a, a convenient, uh, you know, press meeting. Anyway, and um, I remember very well. I was invited by uh, the then IAE I director general to Vienna, uh, sometime in February two thousand three, and he returned back from. Um, Tehran and saying that um, Iran will have a hard time unless they agree to a plan that he had in mind, and one of which was, you know, asking Iran to sign the addition protocol for not expecting to ratify <laughs> in the Iranian match list. Uh, that would be far too difficult. And he set a set deadline, which was 31st of uh, this uh, October 2003. And then only uh, shortly before that deadline, uh, the, the EU, so-called EU three intervened because there were all these talks about striking Iranian facilities by the US, Israel, et cetera, which would be a complicated issue uh, very much. Um, so non aligned moving countries were, uh, of course, on the one hand, um, uh, supporting Iran because they wouldn't like to be dependent on the Western countries as this supply. Because the Iranians, I know from my conversation and from the you know, publications, that they were promising them to share technology that the West wouldn't share with them in the future if and when they get to the point. Uh, so, uh, therefore, they saw Iran as a potential nuclear supplier. And the United States, I think it's obvious, you know, so, you know, Iranian capabilities are. Threat, and not only for its interest for Israeli security as well as Gulf countries, but at the time pursued only a stick only policy, which I was challenging my friends from the US and diplomats, academics, journalists, when they were uh, almost quitting the same thing that Iran should not enrich uh, even uh, zero gram of you know, value. I said, look, whether you like it or not, this is their right. I mean, it was stemming from the NPT. You can just, you know, and do, the more you put pressure in this direction, the more you will have to make more concessions in the future. So let's be logical and let's be meaningful. Um, after all, um, 
the United States uh, had to mind, uh, bear in mind, of course, Iran's capabilities, large territory, some 60% more territory than Turkey, for instance. It probably, because Turkey and Texas have almost the same mm -hmm. uh, territory, so you can imagine how big it is. 1995 million population. Um, as far as I know, almost everyone supports the nuclear program. And even I met with some people who introduced themselves as from being from the opposition, and they said, yeah, yeah, well, we, we do want nuclear weapons as well, but not in the hazard modes. That was kind of, you know, I'm paraphrasing what they said. So uh, therefore, um, from the US perspective, um, Americans and anti-Israel feelings, of course, played into the hands of Iran. I mean, even, even if you go to Europe and country like Italy, France, you could hear very anti-American, anti-Israel sentiments there as well. I mean, it's not only an issue of Islamic or Muslim countries, or not, not the Middle East only. Uh, as I said, the European Union tried to find a middle way, uh, avoiding a, in another confrontation in the Middle East, and also benefit economically from the vibrant population and young population that would buy European goods and uh, bring them profit. Um, Russia, of course, um, one major concern that uh, Russia had, you know, um, probably they were not so afraid about uh, even would be nuclear capability of Iran because, you know, you could never even compare them militarily, uh, even if they had nuclear weapons in Iran. But they used this as a leverage in order to stop Iran's ambitions towards Central Asia and, uh, you know, former Soviet republics. So, because Turkey and Iran rushed to the Central Asia right after you know, the United uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, and it, at the time when uh, Soviet Union was very fragile, I mean, uh, and Russia was very fragile, and and they only had nuclear weapons that could keep the enemies away. That's why they, you know, uh, had this uh, near abroad doctrine and lowered the threshold of uh, first use. Which they had placed no first use for decades during the Cold War years. Now, this time it was first use and at a very low uh, level. Uh, so that was one thing. Uh, and uh, they, they somehow um, you know, wanted to control Iran's uh, nuclear ambitions by controlling their uh, project. And uh, therefore, that was uh, an issue for uh, Russia as well. For Israel, it's an issue, an existentialist threat, and this is how they perceive it. Um, um, this is something that one may have difficulty in believing because, I mean, I put myself in the shoes of an Iranian decision maker, unless I'm suicidal, which I don't think they are, by the way. I mean, yes, they are, they may be radical, they may be uh, under the influence of some, you know, um, religious beliefs, et cetera, but being suicidal or something else. You must be out of your mind to attack your, in Israel with nuclear weapons, knowing that Israelis and the United States at the least will retaliate by more than kind and you will be devastated if and when you attack Israel. So this is not going to happen, but this is hard to you know, convince the Israeli decision makers because they don't want to see even the slightest you know, margin of error and making a mistake because it's something that they cannot really um, I want to test. So uh, therefore they were always talking about carrying out uh, even the military, I mean, with limited uh, military strike against the Soviet, that could only be hard for their um, capabilities. Of course, as I said again, IES um, first and foremost concern was to keep Iran at a level that they could send you know, inspectors or install some Machinery that could keep track of the you know, uh, ongoing processes in the test areas. Uh, um, and they also wanted uh, the, the additional protocol to be enforced, uh, even if it was a matter of fact, because Atomy government promised uh, in late 2003 until mid 2005, until they had not have any chat, that they were, act, they, were, they were going to act as if it entered force for Iran. The addition and the open um, most of the, the service. So, uh, U.S. intelligence services um, had, you know, some information, but uh, governments may not be satisfied with the level or, or accuracy of that information because what 
with the potential collateral damage would be, of course, a concern. And there were some intelligence failures and also stories about you know, um, Iraqi uh, WMD capabilities, which were very much uh, you know, debated in, in the public media. So and even if they did and you know hit the right place, it would only delay for several years, and more and Iran would come back even more powerful and with more support is probably around the world. That's why European Union said, okay, let's find a middle way and um, uh, you know let's uh, skip this issue only uh, uh, you know in the field of diplomacy. Um, again, uh, Russia. In, would like to be uh, seen by the rest of the world as you know a, a potential and a trustable supplier because if they somehow dump Iran for some reason, they will not be able to find other customers. So they are also, as I said, uh, trying to uh, control the, the Iranian uh, meddling in the Central Asian problems. They want to limit this to make them but, um, from the possible. But from Israeli perspective. Doing nothing would be more riskier. Uh, and so whatever the consequences would be of doing something, because uh, the cost of doing nothing would turn out to be far greater than carrying out a limited strike. And possibly they would not be as much concerned as the political consequences as would you know, the Americans. Um, after all, you know, it, they would probably leave the scene to the Americans to clean things up and, and find, a, uh, find a political way out. Um, Again, uh, the IEA um, wanted you know, to uh, cooperate. But the issue is that all this talk about striking facilities, fairly American uh, positions, European interventions, the you know um, the tension was quite high, and um, therefore, um, especially with the uh, deterioration of the situation in, in the Middle East after this spring out of spring and the civil war in Syria, uh, Europeans in the first place and the neighboring countries have been much more concerned because they have seen not only the effects of potential effects of Iran nuclear program, but how much Iran would be um, capable of you know manipulating the uh, politics in the region uh, or affecting the, the situation on the ground. So, and especially in Gulf countries as well, had uh, major concerns. Anyway, uh, with the coming of uh, Rouhani, and uh, I was in um, uh, Frenze, Florence, in Italy, uh, during, on the day Rouhani was elected with Hussein Musabian, who worked for uh, the Atemi uh, government and also was a very close uh, friend, I should say, maybe, I don't know the great things may work for him, for Rouhani. And I had this opportunity to meet with Rouhani during my 2005 visit to Tehran, uh, which they had invited me to Gulf Security Conference, something like that, Persian Gulf, sir, because they're very keen on the system on Persian Gulf. Uh, if you say our government, they get really furious. Anyway, so, and uh, Rouhani, myself, I remember uh, Steve Miller. Uh, I remember uh, Silencione and uh, Joe Farkovic and myself. I, I think we were four of us. And I, we were just at dinner, and some guy came over. Would you like to meet Mr. Rouhani? Who would? <laughs> of course, I went there. We were four of us, and we had this conversation. I said, I had a very good impression about his uh, style, approach. And I said, I wish this guy <laughs> was the, you know, President, and that was in 2005. And I said that in 2013 he became the president. Anyway, and I and I said everyone in every interview I had on TV or in peace or conferences, I said, now that Rouhani is the president, I'm very positive about the you know and the agreement coming. People were still very you know pessimistic, but then and because Rouhani's attitude back then gave me that impression that he would be for a solution. And that JCPOA came thanks to his, of course, uh, steps. Of course, with the US revising his position of no enrichment, because you cannot you know, put that pressure on a country that has the right to enrich up to a certain level. So uh, this, and of course, there is this 
uh, economic benefits that Iran would entertain. But uh, you know, these are roughly uh, the, the framework of what was uh, you know, brought uh, uh, to the uh, table with respect to enrichment, especially uh, the number of uh, centrifuges, the level of enrichment, as well as the amount of enriched material, all of them would be limited in such a way that would not create at least an immediate concern about a, a, a you know nuclear weapons capability. Uh, for though uh, which they declined to accept for, for, for many years, would have the center was to be as a convert to a, a scientific center. The processing the Iraq facility was exactly for this purpose. And the processing, as you know, when you, you have the capability, just take the full time and put it uh, in the warhead, of course, very much on the spot. And uh, there will be, um, the spend will be, will be exported. And uh, uh, mo sort of monitoring would be according to additional protocol, you know, uh, all these details. And, you know, the problem with Natas was when there's, there was this revelation about Natas that it was being built since 1984, uh, Iranians said, well, you know, we did not have the obligation to inform the IEA until unless there is, you know, nuclear material. No, 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 sir. You know, the spread, not the letter of the uh, treaty, but the spread of the treaty requires you to inform them as soon as you build a huge facility, you're not going to you know, produce popcorns, right? That, or is it gonna, you're gonna uh, uh, do uh, some uh, enrichment. So uh, these are things that, uh, you know, IEA would uh, be empowered with the JCPOA. Sanctions, of course, uh, some would last, but specifically related to nuclear issue would be lifted. And of course, there, was, there will be some financial benefits for Iran. Well, uh, on the left-hand side, you see an article that I published uh, uh, back in 2008. Um, it's just the, the, the first paragraph. The first sentence reads as, Turkey is a country that will be most negatively affected by Iran's nuclear weapons capability if and when, the, when it is developed. If Iran builds a nuclear stockpile, it will only add a new dimension to its already material security position vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf states, etc. So, I mean, when we talk about Iran and nuclear program, everybody talks about Israel. Hey, I'm saying, look, by the way, Israel, whether they admit or not, they have nuclear weapon and they have the United States. <laughs> that's 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 more than enough. And no Iranian will take the risk of attacking. Um, Israel or uh, so, and but there is a um, you know, and I explain in the rest of the paper if you're interested, it's on my personal website. Um, there is a almost 400 years of uh, you know, a kind of balance and peace on both sides of the Turkish Iranian border. There were only some border skirmishes over the last 400 years, no major, major war. Well, since the Castle Shrine Treaty, 1629. So um, therefore, uh, if the, and there is this balance on both sides, population-wise, territorial-wise, militarily, and the region is very mountainous, you cannot fight a war, even if you wanted to. So only the nuclear capability will tip the balance on favor of one or the other part, and Turkey has no nuclear weapons program. So uh, Iran's nuclear weapons program will tip the balance very much in, in Iran's favor, and they will not hesitate when they come to use this as a leverage in their relations with Turkey that will make life a little bit difficult in, in, in that relationship. Well, on the right hand side, this is a book that was published in 2000, March 2009, and that was offered, I mean, the offer came from the publisher, is part of a series in Global Security Watch. There are some other countries like Egypt, Pakistan, as far as I know, Korea, I, I guess, so um, you can read more if you're interested and you want to uh, have it when you're in your library, if you're, if you're interested. Whatever we, I wrote and with my spouse, which is an academic as well, uh, you know, we had kind of forecasts that have been uh, an approval, approved by the developments that have taken place, such as uh, the deterioration, deterioration of Turkish trade relations and Turkish Syrian relations at a time when these relations were in their 
you know, uh, most uh, or best times for structural reasons that could not be sold yet. Anyway, well, uh, I will come to that tricky part if you wish uh, later. Well, now let's have a look at the Gulf region. Um, Saudi Arabia, I mean, I don't know if you've been to Gulf. Uh, if you go to the United Arab Emirates, you go to uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar, Oman, wherever you look, I mean, if there are maps, it's all about the southwestern part of Iran. It's all Iran. The whole world is, is Iran. And as if there's no other thing, no other country in the world has so obsessed with Iran's capabilities with or without nuclear weapons. So Iran's nuclear weapons capabilities, as I said in the first sentence in the, in the, in the article, uh, it will only add another dimension to the threat perception of Gulf countries. Well, we all know that there's this Abraham uh, agreement with you know, Gulf and, 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 and Israel, as well as a you know, very much improved relations rapprochement between, you know, through the uh, brokerage of uh, China uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. But these are all diplomatic initiatives and how much they are resonate in, in among the you know hardcore uh, security people I'm not sure I mean one has to uh, carry out a research and but still they are very much concerned at the beginning uh, especially Saudi Arabia uh, United Arab Emirates Bahrain they were all concerned about JCPOA and they thought pretty much like Trump and Israel who were from the moment first moment onwards against the JCPOA they, they didn't find it sufficient enough to stop Iran's ambitions. But some of the countries like Oman, which played a kind of facilitator role, because there were some P5 plus one meetings in Oman, some were in, taking place in Istanbul and Geneva, as you know, where the deal was cut finally. Qatar and Kuwait have been, you know, somewhat positive about the uh, forthcoming uh, outcome. So uh, uh, there is this uh, lack of confidence that affects uh, the uh, relationship, but for the time being, especially since uh, you know uh, Trump uh, withdrew the United States from JCPOA, and it's not P4 plus one anymore. I mean, it doesn't make any sense because even if the other countries you know stay around the table, maybe or they did not, they were not, they have not withdrawn their positions, but. Uh, it doesn't make any sense so long as the United States says, well, if you make business with, with Iran, you're my, on, my, on my blacklist. No European country would do anything with, with Iran in terms of providing what they had promised if things went uh, in the right uh, direction. So, uh, but they, on the one hand, the Gulf states, on the one hand, they complain about um, especially Biden uh, administration of Trump because they now Biden tries to restore the situation, but Blinken made some uh, sort of uh, made this condition upon Iran taking certain steps, and Iran Iranians objected to that, saying that no, it's you guys. I mean, that who are with Trump? Why should I make um, these steps uh, first? And you should do and take steps first, etc. There's this uh, you know uh, back and forth uh, discussions, and uh, on the one hand, uh, there. Are, uh, you know, concern about Biden being soft, you know, relatively, of course, on Iran. While on the other hand, they don't, uh, they also want or see the uh, any potential agreement if, if it all comes out of the um, on and off uh, negotiations in Vienna. Uh, they think this is the least bad option. <laughs> so this is uh, in order to be able to keep Iran away from the bomb. So these are all my a sort of uh, remarks. I don't know how long I speak, but I think uh, that uh, would be enough for the uh, food for thought. And if you ask any, you, know, you can ask any questions about the region, about Iran. If I have the answer, I'll get I'll give you the answer. If I don't, I just uh, <laughs> shut up. Uh, well, I'm happy. Is Iran going to get the bomb? Do you have the answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I believe they want the bomb. This is my personal opinion. I, I told this to my Iranian friends, colleagues, and diplomats that I know, and they know that I speak my mind, and I'm not just holding back some of, well, of course you cannot speak everything, especially if you promise, I promise them to not to reveal whatever they say. You know what, what I did? Um, 
especially in my second trip, which they invited me, and I had to fly Iran Air. At the time, it was too risky because they were always talking about Iran Air doesn't have spare parts, always, you know. Yeah. It, it, it was like the was worst it, flight safety record of any airline. Yeah. But yeah. it was nice. Well, <laughs> their airplane was kind of, kind of old, but I got the answer right. And <laughs> the hospitality of Iran, I cannot forget, especially the food yeah. and the friendship. I mean, because they knew me and Mustafa Zahran, when he invited me, would you like to come and will we cover you, of course? I said, yeah, but you would have to you fly your own air. Okay. <laughs> because for a researcher uh, on the subject, you know, on, on the, and you you have the opportunity to go to Iran again, and this time with Iranians, uh, the, the formulary inviting you, that's like a bingo. <laughs> uh, so um, th during that Persian Gulf conference, I had the chance, I made the you know, appointments beforehand, and also ad hoc uh, conversations, Every time, and this is for the graduates, uh, graduate students. I mean, of course you know, but just you know, let me repeat something you probably know. I always said, look, I'm doing this. I'm such and such person. Here is my position. This is my purpose, the purpose of my research, of my interview with you. And I promise you, I will send you the, the, the quotes that I will use from this interview and get your approval in Britain and then only you know, the center data up to all that. I did this and when I returned to Balfour, I finished my paper and before I sent to Middle East Journal, uh, and sent to every single Iranian and I got every single Iranian's written approval. I keep them still in my uh, booklet because one day, well, of course uh, I wouldn't think they would do, but if somehow, no, Mustafa distorted this story that I told him, that will be put you. They will put you in trouble. You have to have the proof of what they said and that what they have to. Only one of them said, "Mustafa, this time don't quote me on this one. You can quote me on the other one, but not on this one." So therefore, this is something. And and by the way, in my first visit, when I said, "Look, why are you telling me all this that you would never tell anyone else?" And Mustafa Zahrani told me, "Look, we studied you. This is the exact word." We studied you. You are a brave man. We know somebody will write this. We trust you will not you will not destroy the story. And we want you know you, you to know certain things. I said, are you trying to manipulate me? If you do, just forget it. You can't manipulate me. And I will not you know uh, write things that you want me to write on your behalf. No, no, no. We trust you, and we know that someone will write this about this subject. I wanted you to. With the person, I said okay. Yeah. So, and um, when actually in the previous year, I had an article in the this journal on Turkish Israeli relations. Uh, clash of interest over northern Iraq drives Turkish Israeli Israeli relations to a cross crossroads, which was published in two thousand five, January, uh, and the next year again, January two thousand six. The editor writes like this. Normally, we don't accept another article from the same author, at least after several years, but his points are so powerful that we have to find our own group. So that, that good for the Shah, not for the Mullah, and he runs the program. So this is the article I suggest you read. And uh, I give some hints as to how that could be resolved. Shock therapy with Israel uh, and Brent, um, something like a deal with the American, I, I forgot even my own article, so 20 years ago. So um, that almost came with the JCPOA. Because if you study a subject with all its aspects, without you interpreting your own judgments, but try to be objective even to yourself and get as much information as possible from every direction, then from looking at, looking at the information from a distance, you can see pretty much Think that others can see. And then, especially uh, during that Pagwash uh, meeting in, in in Hiroshima in 2005, sometime in July, and um, I had this conversation with two Iranians, high-ranking people in politics and, and academia. I said, during this conversation, kind of, cut crap, what do you, how do you think this is going to be resolved? 
I mean, you say you don't have any ambitions to build nuclear weapons, but you don't accept this and that. Well, Mustafa, this is our so look, you can tell anyone else, but not me, you know, you know, I know the subject and cut from what do you want. That's why they said grand bargain with Israel with, with American America and shock therapy with Israel. The grand bargain is hundred billion dollars, which I mentioned in my article with 2006 problems, and shock therapy with Israel. That was it's it's written in the in the in, in the article. They said it's gonna be an indirect recognition of state of Israel by recognizing every resolution regarding uh, the Middle East. Iran would make an official statement recognizing every UN Security Council resolution regarding the Middle East, implicitly recognizing the you know, creation of state of Israel. So that would be a good thing had it been uh, you know, uh, realized, but looks look at where we are right now. Over the last two months, it's all carnage and hell. In the middle, this is uh, the Abraham Accord, the, the Turkish trade relations, which were going very well for the last two or three years, and they were just about to, you know, turn the corner, and everything is out of the middle. So again, that's the Middle East with nice colors <laughs> when you look at it as a map, but when you go on the ground, <laughs> it's not the same. Well, no, I feel like I have to ask something really spectacular after all this build up with the technical <laughs> issues. But, uh, well, no, let me just first say it's such a pleasure to uh, be talking to you in this um, uh, venue, uh, Professor Kibarola. Uh, it's such a privilege to have listened to you uh, uh, of all places uh, here and as a professor of my alma mater as well. So I'm, I'm so happy that uh, I got the chance to hear you speak here. And I wish I was there. I was there a few days ago uh, in, in Middlebury. Uh, but uh, well, uh, back to work now. So um, hello, everyone. I don't have uh, any um, questions per se, but uh, just wanted to make a few remarks maybe about uh, the historical perspective, of course, um, uh, it is, uh, I have, I was, I think, I was just um, in 10th grade when you were in uh, Middlebury doing your postdoctoral uh, professor. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so please uh, just allow me to make these remarks knowing full well uh, of the um, depth of knowledge uh, you have in this uh, decades uh, of uh, uh, knowledge in this field. Just that um, I think it's very important to keep in mind the historical perspective of uh, Iran and Turkey relationship. And you, as you have underlined in your presentation about, uh, about how deeply affected this balance uh, would be if uh, Iran went nuclear, uh, it would be the most, uh, I think, substantial uh, impact would be in our relationship with Iran. Uh, considering that um, uh, we had our up, we have our ups and downs, but um, an example that comes to my mind is uh, we have been sharing almost the same border since 1639 with Iran, and uh, our current border really rests on that momentous uh, treaty between uh, the two countries. Uh, and uh, again, this would be a historical. Um, uh, historical change in the strategic relationship we have with the country. Um, I was going to planning to ask you something about um, at what level of uh, latency Iran would be, but I think Professor Nuff's uh, question was uh, also to that end. I wasn't able to hear at, at some certain points, but uh, if you feel uh, so inclined, uh, I would be happy to listen to that. Uh, but otherwise, it's just uh, great joining in online and listening to you. Thank you very much. Thank oh, you. And I see Ali online over there too. So hi, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm here too. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you come over here so that you can see? I see Sam. 
<laughs> That's okay. All right. Well, uh, the pleasure is mine and, uh, being here and seeing you again. <laughs> Actually, um, Iran has, uh, you, know, uh, you know, hundreds of years of civilization, a very well organized um, statehood, and all this, you know, uh, experiences and a major power in the region. Um, so it's, well, many colleagues from United States as well as Europe were, when, when they look at the Middle East, they see a bunch of um, government-like entities that they are not governments in their minds. I said, look, whatever you mean by that, you know, make a distinction between them and Iran. Iran is a state. And therefore, just like Turkey, I mean, they may be economically uh, maybe weak or fragile or powerful, doesn't matter. Being a state is something else. So they won't be in a rush, like Saddam was, for instance. You know, uh, I know from my, again, friends and colleagues who were involved in the, uh, you know, uh, the inspection process after the first Gulf War between 91, I mean, United Nations Security Council resolution since 87, you know, created ONSCOM and gave the you know, task uh, mandate to the IAEA. And uh, what was told the whole world before even you know, the Iraq war was that Iraq was going, was almost three years ahead of, oh, away from nuclear bomb. And all these inspections, have shown that they were not even 30 years close to the bomb. So, because I, I, I was curious to know what the real reason was, and someone whom I believe has the capacity to know that perfectly, and I cannot, of course, disclose his name, but uh, he said that was because the scientists always gave him reports about how good were things going on. I mean, I'm talking about Saddam Hussein and Iraq nuclear program. And they were you know, painting a rosy picture in order to save their lives. <laughs> Otherwise, if they gave a you know um, a picture that he wouldn't like, they would be banished. So, and therefore, Satan thought he was really close to the bomb, which he was not by any means. But Iran is not such a country. It's not a dictatorship in, in the way you can compare and contrast Iraq. And Iran is, you know, sees in itself. This, these are all my interpretations. Look. Uh, uh, this is how I see it, and my Iranian Iran point to notice very well. They believe they have the right to be in the club of major powers, which they think they are. And in many respects, when you look at the rest of the world, you can qualify, qualify them as such by, for some reasons. So, um, therefore, uh, they took some steps fast forward when the uh, terrain was okay. When you know the whole world was distracted by Iraq war or something else, and when they felt the heat around the corner, they lay low and even make some steps backwards and use diplomacy, quiet. So they got to the point where, as as I told the, the you know, American diplomats all the time, look, now you don't give this much. Next time you will have to make a concession to be there. And if you don't agree to this, you will have to make a concession, concession here. So therefore, they use diplomacy much better than most American diplomats. Right? And they elevated themselves to the position of where they are, which means uh, a significant amount of enrichment running at the 60 plus percent enrichment level, which is a very significant amount and very significant percentage because especially even after 20%, the, the time left for the rest going up to the 90 plus percent, that is weapons grade, it's not a big deal in terms of time and energy. So, and accidentally they say they average up to 84%, uh, which is something that is significant, whether it was accidentally, whether it was deliberately, I don't know. So. Uh, there are some reports, of course, one has to look into the veracity of this report um, into a different uh, means, and IAEA is in a position to somehow make any comments, and I heard the Director General of the IAEA saying, and you know, also in the 
First, that uh, Iran has every single thing that is necessary to build a bomb if there is a political decision. I don't think there is a political decision right now because Iran is entertaining everything a nuclear weapons uh, country would entertain if, when they have the bomb, which is power and privilege. They have the privilege of being treated as the only country in the world by being uh, sitting around the table with P5 plus one countries. No one else has been so well treated. I mean, in terms of, you know, politically and, and, and diplomatically. Uh, and the whole world, you know, uh, is concerned about their capability and, and the Gulf area with or without the bomb, they are concerned. So there is no reason to prep, cross the threshold and to attract much more heat and maybe even a strike against their facilities. They are not in a rush. They, they, they are not um, sort of uh, taking the risk of being attacked. But who knows what, what's going to happen in, say, three to five years. Um, something like what is happening these days in the Middle East, in Israel, Hamas, Israel, Gaza. I mean, multiply this by five with much bigger attack by Hamas or Hezbollah. How much Israel will be concentrated on this immediate threat? And then maybe an opening for Iranians to take advantage of the situation. You never know. So therefore, my concern is that they have everything, not some balls, and the capability, knowledge, everything that even the most professionals, the IAEA and other professionals have admitted that they have what is missing now, hopefully, is the political decision. And I believe and I hope reason will prevail, as has been the case so far at the political level, that Iran will not build the bomb. Because um, Turkey's case, and I, this is my subject, you know, matter which is published in the NPR, uh, Turkey's quest for peace and nuclear power, which I wrote when I was here, 96, 97, and it's in the spring summer issue of 97 NPR. Um, well, Turkey, although it's a country which has fulfilled every single requirement stemming from the MPT uh, obligations, has not been able to bring in peaceful application of nuclear technology uh, from its Western allies. The United States, Germany, Canada, always there were engagements, but at, at certain stage in the final analysis have not become, have not been uh, 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 fruitful. Uh, so therefore, now there is a Russian company building a Russian nuclear, uh, nuclear power plant on Turkish territory, which belongs to Russia and which will be administered by the Russians. Of course, there will be Turkish officers probably in mid carrying them. So therefore, um, I mean, when and, and these questions came to me even after I published the reasons why and how Turkey could not bring in uh, peaceful application of nuclear technology, nuclear energy, even still uh, the West has concerns about Turkey's potential nuclear ambitions and when they ask whether Turkey will or will not have nuclear weapons, I say, you don't want Turkey to have nuclear weapons? Okay, stop Iran. So that's the answer. Because if and when Iran gets the bomb, that will put additional pressure on Turkish decision makers. I'm not saying that Turkey will go nuclear right away. It's not the scenario that I have in mind. But there will be uh, requests coming from within the public domain, among, among the academic circles, maybe politicians, uh, maybe interest groups. Well, there will be those against NGOs protesting against potential. But this will make life difficult for Turkey because if you reciprocate, this is trouble. If you don't, well, for instance, uh, you know everybody knew that Pakistan had nuclear weapons capability, right? And when India carried out nuclear test, Clinton administration tried to you know, convince Pakistani the government that they don't have to prove themselves that they know. After all, the Pakistani government said, "Well, you know, but the people don't. Mm -hmm. They won't convince. They won't be convinced if they did it." So there will be a lot of pressure coming from within the Turkish society, and that will put pressure on the Turkish diplomats uh, and, and the politicians and the military. And my personal conviction is that 
whomever you may talk may have in his or her mind, uh, maybe a you know, positive feeling about nuclear weapons. But if they are in responsible posts, as a diplomat, as a military person, personnel, or a, a politician, they know and they are quite aware of the potential consequence of you know, violating the NPT obligations, and that Turkey will not go, you know, down the road as a, as a in a clandestine program. Because Turkey's uh, sort of habit is, if Turkey signs up with a with a treaty or you know a convention, Turkey you know uh, you know abides by the rule. Otherwise, just like the law of the convention or other conventions that there exist, they don't sign, even if they are one of the very few countries. So I wish uh, uh, Iran's kept, well, this doesn't mean that, I mean, uh, let others have or uh, only Iran, no. That's why I worked back in 95 um, during my unit of fellowship, as I said, on a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East, no matter how far away, uh, as a as a you know um, uh, uh, project, but somebody has to, and uh, this is the only way out. Because now I say we are reading the easier chapters of the book. The more difficult chapter is that non-state actors, which can complicate the issue far more than is, is the case today, and especially if and when they acquire the ability to and put together several <laughs> weapons of mass destruction, no matter how good they may be, but they will still cause a lot of, and you know the states, you know where you can hit if you have to, you know how to deter, but with non-state actors, transnational non-state actors motivated by some religion, distorted versions of religions or some mystic beliefs, this is gonna be the most difficult thing for states, especially at a time when they may have hands on uh, material that are used in the production of nuclear weapons, chemical or biological agents. So therefore states should collaborate as much as they can and without shooting it at each other, they should uh, define the real threat out there, which is the non-state actors and the possibility of them acquiring weapons of mass destruction capability or material used in their production. So that's therefore, an important thing. Well, I, that was a long answer, but uh, I, I wanted to say this needs to be on the record. So why don't we take a couple questions in the yes. room and you can choose what to address. And in part, you might synthesize, you know, I'm, you have a lot to say, I think, about all these topics. And so I think that's a good way to get a couple of people on the table. I'm going to put one on the table. Um, Michael, you can jump in and then Sherrod, I see you as well. Um, and Ali. So why don't we take all four? Sure. I can, we can sort of help you keep track of them. So one question that I had was, you've said a number of times, Turkey would be the most impacted by an Iran with nuclear weapons compared to all the actors who would be impacted. And I was curious to hear a little more specifics about how you thought, in fact, Turkey would be impacted. And I guess there are two versions of it. So one is an Iran with a kind of bomb in the basement. And maybe that's already where we're at now, like an Iran with an unrealized nuclear weapon, but that's quite close to having a nuclear weapon. And that gives it some kind of leverage. And the other is, I think, what you're alluding to, which is an Iran with a nuclear capability that's probably declared. They probably test. They probably declare it. It's open. And I'm just curious, like you alluded to the border, like the implication, I think, was that Iran would use its nuclear leverage to try to change the border. Is that, in fact, the thing that you think Turkey is or should be worried about? Like, what are the actual foreign policy implications of a Turkey that's trying to live with an Iran with varying levels of nuclear weapons capability? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. And let's go around and then we can help you sort of. Um, so, Michael, let's jump in. Hello, I'm Michael Dutzman. I'm a research associate here at CNS. Um, Iran has a very large ballistic missile program, and the Turkish ballistic missile program is itself um, growing capability. How do developments in Iran? affect the decisions on missile development in Turkey? If you had okay. oh, so got the missile question as your second question. Um, Sharad and then Ali. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kibaron. So just on a uh, passing note, uh, I was a postdoc fellow at CNS 20 years after you. <laughs> <laughs> I did in the. I have to make everybody feel old. <laughs> <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> um, but 
thank you for your uh, for your comments. So you were talking about your experiences um, in interacting with uh, Iranian academics, uh, scholars, diplomats, etc. Uh, one of the questions that was uh, issues that uh, that was coming to my mind was how do you see the different uh, non-state actors, uh, terrorist groups, militant organizations? Um, connected to Iran or internal, uh, as well as internal uh, security actors like the IRGC, um, how do they um, view the nuclear weapons program? I mean, I mean one uh, point that you noted was that there is, you know, there's a fair degree of unanimity uh, that uh, that yes, Iran should have a nuclear weapons capability, but as you said, just not in the hands of uh, that was the person who presented himself to be in the position. I'm not right, sure. sure. Uh, but uh, I, I wonder if uh, in your research and in your interactions, there's been some indication of the other uh, uh, actors, uh, proxies mm -hmm. and militant groups that are connected to the, the, the regime. Have they been saying uh, anything about uh, nuclear weapons or, you know, just statements or anything? Okay, oh, yeah. uh, I'm Ali, I, I'm a student here of the NPTS uh, program. Uh, so there were uh, there were two very important statements uh, with regard to the Iranian nuclear program. One was in 1974, after the Indian nuclear test by Raza Shah Pahlavi, who said that uh, who said if India and Pakistan could think about the bomb, why can't Iran? That was a very significant statement. And then there, there was a, a fatwa by uh, Omeni in 1986. Now, these are two extremes. And Iran's current diplomatic parlays talk about the second statement from the first statement. And between the two statement, st statements lies geopolitics. Geo if geopolitics were to go south, Iran could revert to, to, to a 1974 statement. And if it goes um, north, we could, we could continue with the 86 statement and the opinion. So what is that geopolitics? What could it take to go either way? And my second short question is that AKP, the AKP party has been, has had a lot of nuance when it comes to Iran policy regarding Iran future program. It has not sided with the West. It was quite pro-West before, but the AKP's policy on the program is a tad more nuanced. So what, how would you like to comment on well, very good questions. Yeah, um, help you. Yeah, Maybe sure. Um, thank you. Well, I'll try to give answers to all. Maybe more to some. I'm not very good in, in terms of uh, Iran's connections to proxies and, <clears throat> well, even, uh, you know, how they think about it. But um, I would guess that there would be unanimity as well if there are these connections. And I, I don't think they would go out of protest Iran getting the bomb if Iran makes that decision. So uh, IRGC uh, is most radical because uh, you say Musavi and during the Hatemi uh, period when I was in 2003, we were going to some place outside of the city because uh, they wanted, um, you know, that was in uh, 2005 Persian Gulf Conference. Uh, there were participants from different parts of the world, and they, they took us to a place where they said, now ask anything more. So, and there was quite open. And <laughs> um, I, during that uh, trip, I had this uh, nice conversation with Hussein and said, we are uh, in, in very much under pressure because if we, uh, you know, go along with the, you know, request of EU3, radicals are criticizing us. If we didn't, now the Europeans and Americans are criticizing this. So, and they will regret when we go and uh, someone radical, they didn't know the Ahmed that Ahmed was coming, but someone uh, from his caliber would come and they will regret not having agreed on every term that now we also propose to the West. So um, I think um, if Iran has connection with these organizations, they will probably listen to what Iran tells him to, uh, to do and to, to not do. So uh, regarding the first question, by the way, yeah, I mean, 
if it's if it is or it's going to be a bomb in the basement, I believe the Turkish intelligence capability will definitely uncover this, and they will make sure if there is such a capability or there will be such a capability, they will know that there is a such a capability or there will be, there will be such a capability. Um, the reason why uh, I uh, think that way, uh, people might agree or disagree with me, is that um, I've seen on a number of occasions, especially during the Ahmadi Najat administration, uh, uh, Iran um, was quite uh, vocal when it came to criticizing Turkey open. And because uh, just like this question, I mean, last, the second question, uh, AKP, the Justice and Development Party, AK Party, came to power. Uh, the, the constituents of the AK Party is, uh, you know, composed of mainly middle class, uh, you know, uh, uh, commerce, uh, commerce people. I mean, they are making trade. And until then, until AK Party came to power, uh, the uh, the sort of uh, the impact of the military on the government. The policy and foreign policy, especially security policy, was huge. There was no way an Iranian chief of general would even come close to the Turkish, the headquarters of the Turkish general staff. A few weeks ago, they had a meeting, <laughs> and even years ago as well. So, uh, because Iran was seen as a country that was trying to meddle in, in Turkish politics and provoke some sort of a public movement. And that would topple the secular government and bring in a you know, more conservative the government service. So Iran was a dark, you know, uh, you know, neighbor. And so for until AKP came to power. And not only, well, if I don't think religion had that big a role in that, because uh they are more pragmatic people, unlike most people think uh, in the West. Uh and they wanted to take the advantage and use the Putin to make more trade. And trade between Turkey and Iran maybe increased tenfold. So therefore, that's one part of the reason. And after all, I mean, uh, the constituents of AKP are, have always been concerned about American intentions vis-a-vis -vis the region, vis-a-vis -vis Turkey and Israel, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, there was another common denominator Again, another reason is, which I also uh, explain in one of my articles, um, both you know, the kind of, I wouldn't call it a rapprochement in the formal sense, but the two countries have started to understand each other better and get closer, uh, especially after 2003, when the United States came to the region, not for the same goal, for different reasons, but they common denominator uh, was the United States being here in the region. With 150,000 US troops on the ground, Iran was very much irritated from that. And with the same uh, US and Israeli you know, ambitions over uh, Northern Iraq and the sort of allegations that they, they were promoting a Kurdish state, which would eventually ask for some territories from Turkey. So U.S. active, you know, actual presence in the region was a major cause for concern for both. So not for the same reason, but the, the cause was the same, United States presence. So that's how, and the business, and trade, and everything uh, brought them together and closed. So therefore, um, in some respects, um, you know, there were some, you know, essential visits, Erdogan went there, Ahmed Rizal came to Turkey, and um, especially, you know, there's this 2010 deal, the nuclear uh, deal between Iran, Turkey, and Brazil, and which was actually suggested by Obama himself, and if not suggested, but you know, at least endorsed at the beginning, um, thinking that Turkey and I I Brazil could not pull this off, but they did. <laughs> And then, uh, especially, uh, um, although Obama was quite, you know, leaning towards, you know, giving a chance to Turkey and Brazil, uh, Hillary Clinton was adamant to oppose it because she thought that was the only time when they had 
Russia and China on board and they could not risk something like that. Anyway, so that that deal uh, was not a proposal that was put on the table by Turkey itself. It was a proposal coming from the uh, Mohammed al Barade, from the IEA Director General, and without necessarily consulting anyone from Turkey, as far as I know. When Turkey was asked to mediate or somehow be facilitator, Turkey said, why not? Now I'm coming to the point. I was watching uh, TV, and that was 2008, I guess, um, nuclear, no, no, uh, uh, Munich Security you know, Conference, you know, it's being taking place every year. And Erdogan attended them, and at the exit, there were too many journalists. One of them asked with a German accent, I believe he was a German uh, a journalist, asking, uh, would Turkey mediate between the West and Iran if and when such and such? Erdogan's answer is exactly like this. I mean, Iran is our neighbor, and we'd like this you know, problem to be resolved peacefully, diplomatically, and if there's anything, if there's any role we can play, yes, we would like to help. Look, and I was heading to Ankara to Britain University when I was working there, and the next morning I turned on my TV and I heard Iranian foreign ministry spokesperson making a very harsh statement about Turkey trying to meddle in politics between Iran and the West and said Turkey has no role to play. Oops. Look, we are getting all the heat because of having our close relations with you guys. And we are getting all these accusations that we were helping Iran. While it's not our objective and it's not Erdogan's you know, on opinion, but he says, well, if there's any role he can play, why not? Kind of a typical, you know, even I would say the exact same thing. And Iran criticized me. I made just two other statements that almost threatened Turkey. So, and this is when we have good, we are in good terms and we're at an equal par <laughs> in terms of capabilities. And what about equal capability in the hands of Iran and things go south in terms of politics? And then they might want to try to resort to that instrument. That's what war is because you will always, I mean, there's always this you know, discipline in security studies and in the security you know, circles. What if, you know, what if the worst case scenario takes place? You're going to just say, well, don't worry, that's not going to happen. In your private life, you are free to say that, but not uh, <laughs> as, a, as a government official. So, therefore, that was one thing. And therefore, Turkey will be uh, would be very much concerned if and when Iran gets to power. And I think uh, the um, ballistic missile issue. Yeah, I was uh, I served as the academic advisor to Rocket Sun for three years, and I got the invitation. I had no application for that. I, I just uh, delivered a speech at the panel, and next day I got this uh, offer to the academic. Advisor. So I said, "Wow, great! Why not?" Well, I. We were three people uh, from three dis different disciplines, and that, that was an exclusive uh, small group uh, meeting with the top tier of the Rocket Sun people. And uh, we were, I was trying to give a you know long term uh, you know strategic uh, objective about what, how Turkish defense industry and Rocket Sun in particular should go to. Work. Let me tell you something. Uh, well, uh, the missile technology control regime is not binding, but Turkey observes its um, commitment to it. Because Turkey observes its commitment, especially to, I mean, when it comes to any regional or global security agreement, be it a treaty or a convention, whatever, or protocol, because after all, Turkey is part of the West. I mean, NATO is a NATO country. Turkey uh, you know, is bearing this in mind. There is not only NATO security assurances, positive security assurance, but also responsibility under NATO membership that you cannot just you know, do something and that would you know, you know, make life with hell for the rest of the allies. So Turkey observes its uh, obligations. And working on a um, missile project, I was in the first test flight of Bora, which is a ballistic missile, which flew for 280 kilometers. Uh, otherwise, it would hit somewhere in Georgia because you know we, we launched towards uh, eastward at the Black Sea uh, in Sinop. So um, 
Turkey doesn't have any place to test anything longer than that. And uh, otherwise, we would have to risk our own, keeping our own population if we fire from one end to the other. Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, Turkey's defense industry is struggling. Uh, sanctions of our ally, United States, because Turkey bought this S-400 air defense system. It is not anything illegal. Turkey did not uh, violate any law, but still subject to sanctions, unilateral sanctions of the United States because the United States did not like it. Well, Turkey is a sovereign state, has the right, but you may find it logical. You may find it not so useful. You may find it immature, whatever, but you don't have the right to impose sanctions on a deal which is not illegal. The S-400 deal may not be feasible, may not be logical, but it's not illegal. So therefore, um, Turkey, they will not cross the uh, you know, line or violating any legal document being sanctioned by its closest ally, let alone what if Turkey did something wrong, which is not gonna happen. So uh, what I would like to say here in terms of ballistic missile capability, uh, Turkey does not need that long range missiles anyway. I mean, who are we going to hit? And Pakistan, our oldest friend, or India, which we are trying to develop business, or Central Asian republics, or anyone in Europe? Well, uh, well, I wouldn't like to use the term uh, enemy, but let's say, let's call it rivals. We have problems with Greece, yes. And by the way, Erdogan was in Greece just lately and says, let's find a solution to our problems. But the major problem there is, we say, we call it a list of problems, and the territorial waters, continental shelf, Militarization of islands that should be demilitarized, or um, the airspace, which Greece claims to be theirs in flight information region. We call, you know, a bit plural. I mean, problems. Greek side says, no, there's only one problem, which is not necessary. We don't even agree whether we have problems or a problem. But still, if there's going to be a, you know, God forbid, fighting. It's not going to be with far away rivals or far away enemies. So we don't need long range missiles anyway. So all these stories that you may be hearing are you know, speculations. And Turkey does not violate any of its international commitments, be they binding or not. Because they know how sensitive this subject matter is. And if there's such a little thing that they can find as a proof of violation, it will be like a hole in the airplane up in 10,000 meters, it will explode. So there's no way, and had it been the case, Turkey might have, would have been already sanctions on that as well. So uh, medium range, long range, but Turkey is working on air defense systems. Uh, well, maybe not uh, it's, uh, it's at the level of the US, uh, you know, uh, towns, I mean, theater of high altitude or, or local area, but. These are being uh, worked out and, and, and much faster than most people anticipated. And there is a lot of uh, resources poured into the defense industry, which I have always been supported for the last 20, 40 years since I know myself. I mean, uh, for my university years, because it's not only defense, but also high tech, which you can uh, economize uh, at later stages by, you know, civilizing the product that you use for military intelligence purposes before. So therefore, um, I don't think uh, anything, there is anything that one would be concerned about, you know, long range for this I read some of the, the pieces and I, let me tell you something. Um, I won't give names, but right after, you know, uh, um, this uh, um, July 15, 2016, a coup attempt, uh, you know, there was this attempt to take over the Petro like land, you know, transfer the land. This is how it is called Petro. Um, I was, I got these emails all the time about all this Zoom and everything. Hopefully, back then there was no Zoom. I could listen to the, you know, P, you know PBS and other radios. And uh, two colleagues that I know, both in person, me not being there, of course, uh, 
10,000 kilometers away in my radio before my radio. There was, they were telling about scenarios that, I mean, it would be insane for one to even think about that, let alone saying publicly and to the American audience about something about Turkey, a country that they know very well. It was outrageous. And I couldn't connect and I could have sent messages, but I wanted to connect and, you know, at least give some uh, yeah, uh, replies and to clarify the situation. The scenario was that they uh, mentioned was Turkey would um, confiscate the tactical nuclear weapons that belong to the United States and now being based in that injury base in southern Turkey and possibly use or threaten to use against US troops or US allies in the region. What more insane scenario one can think? I mean, how come two people who are from these kind of places uh, can say something like that and attribute such silly, idiotic scenarios to them? I mean, I wish I could connect and call them in person and say, how come you, such and such, say this in my absence? So, I mean, therefore, when I hear such uh, accusations, I really go crazy. I mean, that's, that's insane. So, yes, you may not like Erdogan, you may like, like Turkey, you may not like this and that, you, may not, you don't have to like me either. But let's be honest, we are all academics, we are all in academia. And what's the number of our role? Make research and verify the source and attribute to the person if you can, if you're, otherwise you just make accusations, it's all in the air, people listen to you, there's no a control in your view and it's all image. I mean, how, you know, so when I hear such things from people who are qualified, who I think and believe that they know the truth, can distort the truth that much, just to make themselves maybe more, getting some more, I don't know, uh, retweets or maybe uh, likes <laughs> in their tweets. That's 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 not academia. That's not uh, a moral behavior. So look, I'm not a spokesperson of my government. There is a person, right, <laughs> uh, a diplomat. His role and uh, responsibility and capabilities, you know, more than enough to make Turkey's case or government's case. I'm an academic, I speak my mind all the time. I don't have to please anyone, neither in my country nor abroad, right? So we have to put on the table what we believe is true based on the research and quality research that if we are capable to do it, carry out and then share with people to make some possible. Sometimes you make research, you uh, submit somewhere, if you did for the government, that's understandable, you don't publish it. But Sometimes if you publish, it must be based on verifiable data, verifiable sources. And there's of course a certain margin that you can keep for yourself based on the request of the person who shared information with you as I did in my good for the Shah, not for the MOLA and Iran program, which you see a lot of uh, citations on. And even once asked the White House spokesperson, because somebody asked, I couldn't see, of course, I could only watch and hear. Um, there's a Turkish academic saying that Graham Bagel with the US and shock therapy with Israel in his article. And, oh, that's me. I'm <laughs> 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 Well, of course, I was you know, watching the news. So, um, therefore, this is what I would like to say. One last thing about geopolitics, ge geography, I always tell my students. If you take a class from a so-called international relations professor, a professor go to his or her office, and if there's no map on his on the wall, just go out, go out. <laughs> oh, like, oh, thank God, I have a map. <laughs> okay, you kind of do redecorate my office class. <laughs> By the way, now I don't. I don't in my office because it's a historic building. We are not allowed to have anything, but I have a map somewhere, right? Small. And I always suggest this should be a you know, geography, not you know, physical map, not board group. But it tells you everything, what you can do, what you cannot, what you should do and what you should not. 
it tells you, it speaks. I mean, if you can interact with the map, it tells you everything. Look, I mean, the Monroe Doctrine. I mean, two oceans. And for so long, I mean, I'm asking my students, why did the United States pull back all of the soldiers after World War I, but not after World War II? And why they wanted to have a you know, foothold in, in Europe? Because we two rockets told them that in 10, 15 years from then, there will be intercontinental belt missile and oceans will have no service to you know, serve as barriers. So therefore, the geography tells you almost everything about international politics. Um, you probably know Harold Miller uh, from Peace Research Institute. Frank. He was one of my mentors. I admire him. He probably is retired. Uh, still writing great pieces. Um, he, I, I convened a meeting at Phil Kent University, my former university, in 1999. Invited him, John Simpson and uh, Alex Kelly and others. Um, um, at some point, he said, our Poland eastern border, I mean, uh, our Iran is Poland and Czech Republic. Our Iraq is uh, Austria. And our Syria is uh, Switzerland and Italy. Wow, <laughs> what a neighborhood, I mean, about Turkey. Even Germany would have difficulties. Look, uh, and this kind of, so that neighborhood tells you where, how, with whom you can go along, with whom you will have friction, with whom you will have maybe uh, confrontations. Or, and, and now I just gave a, a speech at Detra yesterday here in their premises at the DLI. And I talk about Turkey's position position vis-a-vis -vis the Ukraine war. And you know, and I got too many questions from the you know audience, and questions I used to get all the way since the war started as to why Turkey behaved the way it does. I'm telling them it's not the decision of the you know government which may have different you know uh, political ideology only. It's the geography which tells you that. There is Montreal Convention. There is Black Sea, literal states. You are neighbors for hundreds of years, and you're gonna be neighbors for hundreds of years in the future. And there's all these straits, the grain deal and everything. So geography is something very important for Iran, of course, especially after US withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, Taliban taking over, and I don't think they go going over with that. And that might be one of the other consequences. So when you look from Tehran 360, who do you see as friendly? Uh, not so many. And maybe Russia, of course, and China, but with some uh, expectation by them to your, at, at your expense, such as uh, you know, Central Asia or um, China. So therefore, geography is very, very important. And I believe Iran colleagues and politicians are also masters of geography, so they will act accordingly. Yes, in the case of Romani, when he came to power, he, as I said, he stopped the nuclear uh, program and let anyone who would like to leave the country, didn't mind. And saying that, you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna make Iran dependent on the West and then, as I explained, Rafsanjani convinced him that it would have been better. If, and because uh, they, they were being uh, uh, irritated by the US presence in the Gulf. And if we had, he said, nuclear program up and running, they would not dare act in the way they do you now back then in the mid early and mid late meetings. So geography is everything. So that's why. Uh, you must have your maps on your wall, and you must have your professors with maps on their wall. Otherwise, I mean, you have to speak with the with the map. I guess what I do all the time. You know, my my best friend <laughs> in my computer. All right, uh, I believe time is. Yeah, I think we're at time. That was tremendously substantive. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, and both to our online audience and our folks who were able to be in the room. Um, so, and you. I thank you for the time, our own online audience, and uh, to spare, thank you for their attendance as well.